We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be dead. One for Satan, two for me. Let's cheat the devil. It's fun. Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Unteed, and with me in the Dog Bowl studios is... Coach Nez. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Libsyn or any pod catchers. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Tuesday night at 10 p.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is Ragged Records in beautiful downtown Rock Island, Illinois, soon to be coming back to beautiful downtown Davenport. We would also like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for letting us use their music for our intro and bumper ending. Our guest tonight is... Brad Sensel of Angels of Dresden. War Babies. Suicide Squad. And TKO. Yeah, it's a, got quite the resume. Uh, been around... Uh, War Babies came out in about 1991, for those mm-hmm. that... Uh, I don't know if... The, the kind of a precursor to the grunge. They were a little bit of a crossover. They had... They, you know, they get labeled that grandfathers of grunge, but... It, so... Here's my thing, is um, we asked them the question yeah. about the first grunge band from the Seattle area to hit the mainstream. He didn't agree, but he didn't totally disagree, right. and he didn't necessarily always give him his full opinion on it. So um, when listening to War Babies... I feel like I feel some of the grungy style that came out of that era. Yeah, I mean, there's and, definitely some similarities to some simil- um, similarities to Mother Love Bone. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and so I I found um, his take on things as far as that um, that time period um, being not necessarily intertwined with the grunge movement but yet still not far apart from it either, if, yeah. if I'm making sense to you at all on that. Right, so. and, for, and for those listeners that don't know, they had the, the, the tie-in to the grunge movement. Is, it was actually uh, Jeff Amet from Pearl Jam was in the band for about six months before, right in between the end of Mother Love Bone and the start of Pearl Jam. Um, so that's kind of the tie-in to the f- Seattle family tree. Yep, yep, yep. So... Well, as far as music news, we really don't have any music news this week. Nope. Um, we want to wish everybody um, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. Whatever thanks you for celebrate. Listening. Yeah, thanks yeah, we for We really appreciate all our listeners out there, and uh, um, we're going to bring you some, some more shows in the new year. We got all of January. Well, we have end of December, all of January full, all of February full, and we're encroaching uh, scheduling artists for. March and it's looking really promising. So, um, it, to all of our listeners that have um, listened to the Nothing Shocking podcast reboot, um, we have lots and lots of artists willing to come on the show to bring you a lot of good material to listen to. We're excited. Yep, we are. All right, well, let's get to Brad Sensel. Have a good night. Good night. Check out Angels of Dresden's new single, Home for a While, available to download now. Hello. Hey, Brad. It's Eric Nesbitt with the Nothing Shocking Podcast. Hey, Eric. How's it going? Well, it's going. It's cold here. <laughs> How is it where you are? Uh, actually, we had, like, what, middle 50s today? Yeah, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, not too bad. We're not, we're not complaining. Hey, I would like you to uh, introduce you to my co-host, Jeff Unteed. How's it going tonight, Brad? It's going good. Well, it's we going are... good. How are you doing? Good. We are like extremely excited to have you on the podcast tonight, and uh, so we have like a ton of questions to ask you. I hope you're ready for all this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> bring it. <laughs> you didn't sound too enthusiastic on that answer there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, well, let's get let's just start right away on this thing. You know, the Angel of Dresden are known to be a co-op of famous musicians that never record in the same room. Talk to us more about the roots of this band, and or is is it a true band, or is it more of a project? How does that work out for you guys? Yeah. Well, it started out as a project and morphed into a band, and then the TKO reunions came up, and so I put it back on the project shelf, and then. Um, COVID hit, mm-hmm. and it, it it was based on um, when we first started out. These were demos. Uh, none of the new stuff is demos, but early on it was demos, and it was an easy way before you went into the studio to have everyone put their ideas in. And then uh, once you were in the studio, you at least had half the battle of where are we going with this. Mm-hmm. But when COVID hit. Um, we kind of had our up our game and uh, figure out more precise ways to pull this off, which meant um, the early songs were done in the studio as a band. And as we got into um, the COVID period, we just split it up into everybody's station. So does that make any sense? It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Good, Jeff. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the name Angels of Dressing? Uh, where, where, is there a story behind that? I'm a history buff, and um, I think I was uh, watching the History Channel and and following World War II, um, and it's just a tragic story. It is. It uh, reading on the bombing of Dresden, I, I got immersed in that, and once we started the the project, so we need a name, and we came up with some doozies, <laughs> and uh, finally I. Uh, Realized I was in the middle of binging on World War II history stuff and landed on Angels of Dresden. Nice. You know, I, I uh, took a, a historical fiction class where in high school, the, the book was based on the bombing of Dresden, Germany. And, you know, the thing that really kind of fascinated me in, a, in such a negative way was there was still to this day, and maybe you've read more about it, that there was really no reason to bomb Dresden, Germany. There was nothing there as far as what as far as manufacture, manufacture manufacturing went as far as uh arms or defense or anything like that for the, for Nazi Germany. Well, correct? it was the art center of Germany. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um uh, it, it was a wonderful place. I I think um they rationalized it uh there might have been something in the port that had ammunition, but that was a little bit overkill and that you know, wars happen, and there's crimes on both sides, but that was a pretty heinous operation there. Absolutely. Well, let's get back into music now. Enough, <laughs> enough about that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, 2014, the band released the debut single, Doomsday. Mike McCready is the special guest on this track. Uh, what was yeah. the, What has the response been like since that first release in 2014? Well, the saddest response is looking back at the data from streaming, when you add all the numbers up between Spotify, iTunes, and Pandora, all the players, we were close to a million streams between all of them. And I was ready to um, just say, okay, let's buy that vacation house. (laughs) And then I, I got the readout in my publishing. And streaming pays 0.000 one per stream. Mm -hmm. So if you're a music history buff, (laughs) it brings you back to Tin Pan Alley at the turn of the century (laughs) where you would sell your song for a dime. I'd be better off then. (laughs) I I added a nickel back in there today. Just listened to a couple of them. (laughs) (laughs) Poor nickel back. Yeah. Yeah. I catch that. (laughs) Um, As far as, uh, um, the the material that has been written for the band, as far as the songs that you wrote, as far what have you um, been able to vault and kind of sit on and wait before you start r- releasing more music? I guess you're doing a kind of song at a time, correct, or track at a time? Yeah, yeah. We're also going back in the catalog. Uh, we have an upcoming song soon to be released. Um, that was in demo form from 2014, I think. 
might be 2013. So we stripped it down, started over, brought in uh, a new drummer, a new bass player, uh, completely recut the track, and we're really happy. We brought in Carl Kennedy from the Rod and um, Chris Barato from Great White and Samantha Seven, and it almost started to feel like a band because between Bryn and I and Chris and Carl. But the ruling is, is, is it's a rolling lineup, and that's the magic of it. And so nobody has time to, to actually get sick of the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and in a lot of ways, it reminds me of TKO because I was signed to a production deal, uh, which was the love of the late 60s all through the 70s before the record industry went, we don't like production deals in other words your producer has all the say mm -hmm. yeah it was the record companies who wanted the power and they wanted to pick the producer and i was signed to this horrid agreement um with rick Kiefer, rest his soul um that i couldn't get out of but other people were able to leave he figured as long as i was there um he was good to go and i could just replace people <laughs> so I got stuck in TKO longer than I should have. Mm. Yeah. Um, as far as your writing process with these songs, when you guys are doing them in separate areas, uh, not necessarily in the same room, um, you're each contributing your own parts, or, or do you already have a basic structure of the song? Um, each individual is sent uh, a rough mix. Uh, the drummer's sent usually guitar rough vocal um it's got a count on the on the file that they open up one two three four uh and they they record the drummer will record his tracks and then send those to the hub and then there's a rough mix of that that goes out to the bass player um guitar player adds his stuff and when things get close then they send me a, a rough mix of it and I sing over it and do the final vocal. And then we get into, is it enough racket yet? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that can last weeks. You know, the interesting thing about uh, file sharing, not a fan, I prefer to be in a venue. Yeah. I prefer to everybody be in the same room, but we can't. So what do you do? The interesting thing is, what it takes to solve a problem in the studio can or in the process can be dealt with within a minute conversation, mm -hmm. which online with text or emails can drag the process out because you don't understand tone in an email or a text. Yep. Never Suddenly played. people are thinking you're being adversarial when you're not being adversarial. Uh, so it can, you know, a minute conversation can turn into a week, you know, and, and that's frustrating. Yeah. Although this round, you know, Zoom seems to be of help because you're seeing a face and you're actually having a discussion. I think text and emails are the devil. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Um, so the big question is, are we or will we ever see the fruition of a full Angels of Dresden album that's going to be out on, as a tangible product that's something we can buy and touch and hold and look at and read and everything else? That's the goal. Nice. Um, and early on, I made the prediction based on the science, as the government says, <laughs> um, that we'd be dropping a song every six weeks. And then we got into... Um, that's probably not going to happen. And maybe that shouldn't happen because not all songs are singles. Um, and I'm a big fan of that. There's a couple of songs that I love. Would I consider them singles per se? Cause I'm old school. Probably not. They're things that grow on you. Um, so we're just lining them up once we have enough to fill God, they don't even have CDs anymore. <laughs> you know? Whatever the media is, you know, once I have enough to get it out in a playable LP, um, do they still call them that? Yeah, I, um, do. I still call them that. Yeah, yeah, which is pretty funny because it's so archaic. <laughs> um, once we have enough, then we'll launch. So we're pulling back from everything to single. 
and kind of going old school back to not everything's a single. Um, so we'll be releasing less, but I'm trying to push for a midnight 2020 release of this next song. Nice. Oh, very cool. Or 2021. Did yeah. I say 2020? Yeah. No, we don't want 2020. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did I say that? Good <laughs> Lord. We knew what you were talking about. Good Lord. No, 2021. To kind of ring out the old year and, you know, ring in the new year. Well, you know, speaking of uh, LP, EP, in this climate of, you know, where the rock business is kind of wavering on sales and it's not what it used to be, what where do you see your preference being as a, a full length, you know, 12 track uh, LP or just a like a five or six song EP? Where, where's your thought process these days? You know, I don't really know because the industry is so upside down. Uh, they don't know. And if they don't know, it's kind of hard for me to say. So it's put me out on the on the ledge to where am I going to go with this? And I can't tell you that now, but I have people that are working on it. Yeah. Well, that's a good way to answer the question. You kind of really didn't really answer it. But that was and the, the other thing is, is <laughs> the industry was pretty well killed Yeah. yeah. Um, before COVID hit. Mm-hmm. And it was upside down in the, the TKO anniversaries. Um, the, the whole trick to touring is it used to be you lose money touring and make money off record sales now you make money off merchandise exactly. and chairs mm-hmm. um so then covid hit and what do you do with that <laughs> you know you sell your merchandise online uh, it's just an odd odd time and we don't know where it's going it's i get daily updates from live nation uh with predictions you know they might consider concerts if you can have a digital proof you don't have COVID. Hmm. And I, I look at that, I just tell myself, you know, keep writing songs. Yeah. Now's your time to write. It is, yeah. Because everybody was pretty much not writing and living off their laurels. And, you know, there's something to that. I kind of enjoy playing the old songs, but I was born to write. And I like the writing process and going out and promoting it as opposed to, you know, going out and playing things that when you were half your age. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, kind of take this into just a little bit different direction. Um, this is uh, obviously a question that's going to be, you need to answer in pre COVID or pre uh, riots of the black lives matter stuff. But um, the Seattle movement, uh, Pacific Northwest rock and roll movement. Where has the status of that gone throughout the years? Um, I, I was saying, obviously, before the riots and everything up there. But as far as, um, you know, obviously, we know that that area of the world was the, the birthplace of grunge rock. Yeah. Um, what is the rock scene like now in the Pacific Northwest? I fled Seattle. <laughs> I got so sick of it. Uh, and I moved back to my hometown, which is about 130 miles east um, from Seattle. It just became a very weird town. Um, I still kept my connections with my grunge buddies, um, Pearl Jam between Stone Gossard and Mike McCready, you know, we're in contact. Mike has helped me out. I worked on one of Stone's projects. Um, and I, my connection with Mike is he does that flight to Mars, uh, foundation thing. Uh, once a year, and I I jump in and out of that. But you know, right now the last show I did in Seattle was my 65th birthday bash, and um, and it felt like Seattle then, and that was 2019. And since then, I mean, there's no shows. There's mm-hmm. nothing. There's people online with acoustic guitars and live you know feeds and that sucks that you're losing you know the whole point of why we do this so i don't know there there is no seattle right now there's other than seattle guys online with acoustic guitars <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that's kind of universal. which i was offered to do that and i said no no, no, thank you although i i have a karaoke machine and i was kind of thinking of doing a you know, kind of monetizing a 
Brad sings karaoke. You should do it. Yeah. I'm down with it. I'd be the first. You know, I, we have a machine that that has over thirty thousand frigging songs, and, and I was kind of laughing um, at doing that. You know, all the way from my my buddy and I, you know, get together, um, and about ten years ago, uh, we were living together before I got married. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, but we were both bachelors and, uh, he bought this karaoke machine and, uh, we'd tip a few and start singing around 10, 11 o'clock at night and go into two o'clock. Once we got into the show tunes, I, I hit pause. I said, you know, if somebody walked in right now, <laughs> <laughs> this would not be good. <laughs> nice. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Well, you know, at least you know your at least you know your parameters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least now I know my price. Yeah. It's zero point zero 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 two. What is that number? Is that if you have a miniature file on a penny, which that's what it represents. Okay, you're sawing away. You're starting off on the right end of a penny. How small of a file would you have to get to zero point zero 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 two? I think it's just going to be just a shred. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it's very unfortunate. Yeah, but, it, it, it's a scrape of the file. It is. It, it truly is. All right, enough of that. Which is why, which is why I think is everybody's all excited because Bob Dylan sold his yeah, uh, publishing for three. Was it three million or billion? I don't know. Yeah, it was a big number. Yeah. I didn't see the number, but I was just thinking, you know, why most people are trying to get their rights back, and, and then you see somebody selling them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the problem is, is there's no payout yeah. in streaming, and there's no payout in a physical disc. So where do you go with that? My, I started laughing because I worked with, you know, the promoter Bill Graham? Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I was summoned in 84 by Bill. Bill Graham management to form a heavy metal super group. <laughs> and oddly enough, it was me and a bunch of guys from San Francisco. And I got there and I went, these guys suck. <laughs> but I've already had moved my wife down there. So I'm like, okay, I'll make this work. But it kept sucking and sucking and sucking. And we had a sucking meeting with Nick Klainos, the head of Bill Graham management. And it was like 3.30 was the appointment, and I was there till 4.30, and out walks, out walks uh, Bob Dylan. And I'm looking at that going, that's Bob Dylan. That's why I've waited for an hour. <laughs> and I walked into Klano's out office, and he apologized. He, he says, I'm so sorry. That was Bob Dylan, the, the man of the hour of the 60s, telling you to fuck the man, just told me, because... Bill Graham management managed Bob Dylan mm -hmm. in the 80s. Mr. Fuck the Man had spent an hour trying to convince Nick Klainos that his nut was one million a year. <laughs> and even Klainos said, I, I'm living in the wrong time. <laughs> Here's Mr. Tune Out. Tune in, you know, yep. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That is a story. But but he's not the only guy that's cashing out. But what they really want is they want the masters. Luckily, I have the masters for In Your Face, TKO, mm -hmm. Condition Unknown, but the science is getting better on how to fluff the acetate up. So who knows? Yeah. I could get 0 0.23 cents. I kind of doubt that. <laughs> TKO is worth a little bit more than that. Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, Jeff's burning to ask you a question here. So go ahead, Jeff. Sure. Um, just going back to the early days of Seattle, and I know you, you started out playing with some, uh, you know, some of the early bands like Mother Love Bone and Alice in Chains. What was one of the – was there any band that you liked out of that early, early 90s sound that didn't make it big that should have? No. <laughs> just curious no 
other than war babies. Yeah. I mean, if that's where you're going with it. Um, it was an odd signing, uh, and it was a political signing. Uh, Allison Chains and Mother Love Bones management was Kelly Curtis. Um, Kelly Curtis now manages Pearl Jam. I knew Kelly Curtis from the days TKO and Hart were managed by uh, Ken Kinnear. Kelly was kind of a gopher and rose am- amongst the ranks. And and it was so politically weird that we were managed by him and that whole thing fell apart. Mm. Well, in uh, 2021, the War Babies will be celebrating its 30th anniversary. Uh, it's, the band has been kind of tagged as the first mainstream grunge band. Um, is that a now, fair, is that a yeah, fair I, I, st- I was questioning that yeah. because I refer to it as the last great American rock and roll band. In that, it's bluesy, it's yeah. dirty, it's I agree. gritty. Um, uh, there's people arrested. It's politically incorrect, and it, it was the last duck of its origin. Now, I completely agree with yeah. what you're saying. But if you listen to Blue Tomorrow, yep. mm-hmm. that's a definite grunge song. Right. My favorite story about that is the um, the record weasel um, who had executive production rights on everything. So it's all political. Um, how did he put it? He said, if I have anything to do about it, Blue Tomorrow will not be anywhere on this album. And I looked at him, I went, okay. Then it hit New York, the video hit New York, and the New York suits must have sent out something because we did a records and radio party, and all the all the big suits from New York and L.A. are there. And I get some New York weasel <laughs> that walks up to me, stone drunk and illegitimate, and says, I wanted to tell you, I appreciate so much Blue Tomorrow. It's so atmospheric, okay? <laughs> so I go, thank you. And I'm thinking of Nick Torzo. Torzo was the A&R guy. Um, love him as a brother, but this week it's kind of a fuck him. <laughs> um, by the next Monday, we're still in the studio, and Torzo comes in. The guy that said, if I have anything to say about it, it will not exist on the album. Walks up to me. He goes, you know, I've realized that I really like Blue Tomorrow. It's so, and he paused and said, atmospheric. (laughs) (laughs) So that, you know, maybe something good will come from this, you know, change, I guess is what I'm saying. It's the industry will change. We don't know what it's going to look like, but I believe in American ingenuity, humanity. People are going to figure out a way to turn this thing, or they're not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let me get back to when I was. Uh, the question was the label of being the first mainstream grunge band. I never felt as though yeah. War Babies was ever a grunge band, but man, you it get was a- designed because they were still courting Aerosmith. I was told this by a good friend of mine from Epic Records, who's a executive head. It's, I want Michael Jackson. Well, he's already signed. Then get me a Michael Jackson. And so Aerosmith was, and War Babies had Aerosmith-ish mm-hmm. tones to it, but I wouldn't pin it to that. It, it, there's some blues stuff in there, but it was a hedge bet on whether or not Errol Smith would resign. At least that's what I was told. I look at and then grunge hit, right? Grunge hit, and then game over. Who cares about Aerosmith? Exactly. But for the for we see so many music nerds, whatever you want to call them, critics, journalists, whatever, and I've read multiple articles that are comparing. War Baby material in comparison to the grungy stuff of the early 90s. That being said is, to try to compare 
war babies to a uh, mud honey or to a uh, any other band from that era, a sound garden or anything, nowhere near the sound, not even close, not even yeah. similar. So I, from, for me on my end of things, and that's where I wanted to ask you the question was, I don't fit, you know, see you guys have ever fitting in that kind of a mold. Did you guys ever feel like that you were a part of that certain era of music as far as... Well, the, the hilarious part is we were managed by the same machine that was pumping that out. But if anybody, you know, said grunge, they probably saw the Blue Tomorrow thing, mm-hmm. which Tommy, my co-writer, always used to say, we made the wrong record, or they accepted the wrong record. Um, somebody sent Tommy um, files of the songs that were not accepted by Columbia uh, for a 30... 30- 30th anniversary release and they're phenomenal mm-hmm. but they were more of the grunge level because that's where we were at mm-hmm. um but columbia wanted us bluesy and gritty and you know that that was their call but they didn't accept the song so the songs are ours so i'm working on a on a 30th release that includes yeah. the the twenty, the thirtieth anniversary, along with I think there's six songs that were refused by Columbia that are fully produced. Oh, that'd be awesome. oh yeah, we need it. Yeah, Jeff and now, we, we, right I, now, but yeah, our ears need it. And they're I, actually I like most of them in the album. <laughs> <laughs> nice, very nice. I missed them. Yeah, Eric turned me on to that Suicide Squad, which came out a few years earlier and that's that's got a couple of great tunes too yeah so give us the lowdown on suicide squad brilliant four song ep Mm -hmm. came out on vinyl i own two copies as you well know and uh we just fell in love with it the first time we heard it and obviously i tuned into it way late it was a handful of years ago when i found out about them um or found out about you and the band and whatever the album um what is the story about suicide squad why didn't it go on to go to bigger things than what it did Yes. Sorry. Have a dog issue. Oh, we have plenty. Okay. Of so the story of Suicide Squad, I was signed under a production deal um, with Rick Kiefer, who did um, TKO 2 and 3, um, and had developed a situation where I could uh, actually get out of the production contract and do my own thing. The first person I went to was Barry Coburn of Relativity Combat Records. And we had just finished with Below the Belt. And I needed something to do. So I called up Barry. I go, I've got Rick Pierce and I are working on some songs. What would you think? He goes, I'll send you a budget. He sent us $400 (laughs) for a budget. Barry Coburn was the king. I mean, relativity, he sold to Sony. Barry's on a beach somewhere. <laughs> um, so he sends us $400. So I go into this iconic Seattle studio that that is known to be alternative people. Mm-hmm. Uh, Soundgarden had recorded there, and the engineer that, that mixed the thing was, you remind me a little of, in fact, quite a lot of Chris Cornell. I was like, well, okay. <laughs> I've been doing this since 74, but okay. <laughs> and so we do the four songs between former guitarists for TKO. I, he's always the guitarist for TKO, Rick Pierce. Mm-hmm. Um, we go back a long ways. And a newbie drummer, uh, Richard Stewart. Yeah who ended up in War Babies. He's the guy that invited me to War Babies. Richard was a little new, so I I ended up putting him on a click track, <laughs> which, which he got addicted to, and I used to bring out a baseball bat and say, knock it off. <laughs> um, and we had no bass player. So if you notice on the credits, Drums, vocals, guitars mm-hmm. are credited, and then when it says bass, it says Rick Bradley. Well, Rick Pier- Pierce's name is Rick, yeah. and I'm Bradley. 
<laughs> so I did, I did bass on two songs, and you can tell immediately who did what. <laughs> That's awesome. So we we record the thing on budget, all $400, uh, and then fire it off uh, snail mail and, you know, wait five days for a response. And Cliff Coltrary, um, who is the brains behind Relativity, and introduced me to Steve Bai, by the way. Mm. Um, and we can go over that. He, we all did lunch one day, and I didn't find out until three years ago that that meeting was hook me up with Steve Vai. Nice. Mm. Apparently, nothing came from that, but I was like, well, that was awesome to know that what that meeting was. What did I say wrong? <laughs> so we send it off. They get it, and Cliff Coltrary, Relativity, calls me as the castle is burning at relativity and says, how much do you want? And I wrote, I, I referred to the TKO contract, which was, it was a tawdry amount. It was like 150 grand for them. That's nothing mm -hmm. for me. That's, you know, mm -hmm. new tires. <laughs> and, um, so he took it to Barry who passed Barry being kind of fastidious and so I snail mailed, this is pre-internet, so I snail mailed uh, another five, six, seven, eight days. Uh, Cliff, I go, well, we tried another five, six days. He said, you didn't hear this from me. Immediately run to every label and get this thing because this is incredible. Mm. So... I then receive an offer from Barry Coburn, which is Tadri nothing squat, and I pass, and we start shopping it. Music from Nations picks it up, and it came out. Yay. <laughs> so it comes out. It, it Great acclaim, in spite of my poor bass playing, it, it had great reviews, but nothing came of it. So we have another year and a half, and I moved to L.A., and I want to take advantage of the in-your-face stuff, but I've run into the poison, you know, hand out flyers on yeah. Sunset Boulevard. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I could not do that. I am a rock god. I will not stand on the corner and hand out <laughs> things. Yeah. I, you know, I'm a snob. <laughs> So uh, I'm down there swinging my bat, and oh, who's the the pretend guitar player for Kiss? Freely, Ace Freely. No, no, no. <laughs> um, the replacement for Ace. Uh, Current. Oh, uh, Tommy Thayer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I I even ran through with him and a drummer on. I actually did an audition and didn't make it. <laughs> I'm so glad because I got the War Babies job. Well, yeah, that was a much so, better gig. <laughs> yeah, and and Tommy looks good in makeup. <laughs> so so it, it's one of those things when things click and when they don't, yeah. and that was a don't click. So um, here we are. Um, it gets shipped out to other labels. Nobody's biting. And then all of a sudden, Rick Pierce says why well, I, I can connect with uh, Music for Nations, which I love Music for Nations, if you know what that is. Yes. You, you know what, what that is? Well, I mean, I own various uh, various vinyl from Music for Nations, uh, different colored vinyl from Music for Nations, but nice. different artists. Um, I love that, out, that, that company. Mm -hmm. And so, so here I'm excited, and Rick tells me, and we go back to high school, he's like, I got an offer from Music for Nation, and I think Barry's price was a thousand dollars. And all of a sudden, Rick has an offer from Music for Nations on his end for five thousand dollars. And I'm like, and I'm used to numbers like 150, 250 yeah. on a starter album, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But at this point, my wife just gave birth, <laughs> yeah. so I'm I'm kind of like, let's take the five. Yeah. So I'm down in L.A., and I reach out to Barry Coburn Relativity and say, I'm on a new project. Here's what it's called. 
give me a call. So he calls me, and Classic Barry says, I really love Suicide Squad. This is the guy that passed on it. <laughs> Loved it. Great, great EP. You know, I had, I uh, bought controlling interest in Music for Nations. I did not know. I did not know. Hmm. So um, we were looking at 150, 250,000 based on the TKO agreement. So he picked it up for. $5,000. And I think Rick was in hard times and he bought a Ford Fairlane used. <laughs> my wife gave birth to my son and I couldn't leave the hospital till they paid them in cash. <laughs> so that pretty much paid for everybody's needs. Yeah. Money well spent. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, so far. <laughs> Although every now and then I remind my son. That's a good reminder. <laughs> I have, uh, I don't know about Jeff, but I have one more question. Jeff, do you have a question? I have one more. Uh, probably. Yeah. Um, so this is my last question. If Jeff has one after you, after mine here, for, after you answer this one. Go for it. All right. So this is more of kind of like a curveball question. Now, how has your writing style evolved from the time in TKO to Suicide Squad to War Babies and then finally to Angels of Dresden? How, is, how has it changed and evolved over the years? Due to the market at first, you know, I've always, I was born in 1954. Imagine that. So I've been through how many presidents and how many fads. <laughs> um, I was sent out of the room to not see Elvis on Ed Sullivan. That's how far back I go. So I've been able to morph. Look at Ronnie James Deal. Look at his history. Yeah. You know, it, he was in a doo-wop group with a, a dilly hairdo. Um, there's a point where you just automatically morph into the next thing, and it's a natural thing. And then there's a point, probably in your 40s, where you start reflecting. And I've been writing for decades. And I noticed with the, the COVID lockdown that um, I'm starting to go back and revisit shit. Um, stuff I used to dismiss because music has become so tribalized. When I started, if it rocked, you showed up and you supported it. But it's turned into this, uh, you know, heavy metal, black metal, death metal, <laughs> you know, all that shit. It, it's an odd place to be. But what what I'm doing currently is I'm going back to I can do anything I fucking want. I'm not a slave to the machine. Um, between Carl Kennedy and I, we started messing around with shit that we were raised on as kids um, to do redos. Mm -hmm. But that ended up in arguments. This is wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> um, I'm just kind of... Sky is wide open right now. We we don't have any other questions for you tonight. That was the last of our battery of questions for you. But um, before we uh, let you go for the evening, is there anything that we didn't go over for promotion that you would like to plug? Okay. This week, we're selling the release of a new single for Angels of Dresden. Nice. And I want to be careful because what we have to do... I will tell you in an email. But the release date, you guys can release on your site once we know what it is. Okay. And I can get my 0 0.0002. <laughs> the enough. good news is I checked my ASCAP account, and I'm surprised you guys didn't ask me about Paul Stanley. Yeah. And I'm thankful. Well, <laughs> we, we figured... We kind, of, we kind of knew you didn't, that it was kind of a source of... Yeah, we kind of figured that you've been there, done that, and so we wanted to kind of keep the Q&A as fresh as we possibly could without, once again... I just wanted to apologize to Paul, because I didn't read his book. I want to apologize for that, but I did read a snippet, and I understand why he was bullied and why he's a bully. <laughs> so he's forgiven. Okay. Fair in enough. the War Babies book. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great book, yeah. a War Babies book. That would be fantastic. I think that you got, you're onto something there. Well, then I'll have a 0. 0.0003. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I don't know, guys. I, yeah. We don't know where any of us are at this right. point. Mm-hmm. None of us do. I believe in the American ethos that American ingenuity still exists. I'm seeing it in some legal avenues here and there. Um, my prayer is ingenuity will figure a way out of this. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, this is how it's going to work. Um we have a couple episodes that we need to release before yours, so we're looking at right around two weeks. And then once uh, Jeff, our editing wizard over here, uh, gets everything all set to go, I will send you the link. You'll be the first one to receive it. And then please share it wherever you possibly can on your social media. We really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, we appreciate your time. It's been an honor to talk Good to talking you. talking to you both. Yeah, it's been an honor to have you on. We've been excited ever since I touched base with you back, I think, in September, I yeah. think it was. So, yeah. And uh, whenever you want to come back on, if you got new stuff that you want to promote or plug and you want to come back on the show, just let me know. We'll be glad to have you back on. Yeah, once we get the next release, I'll give you the heads up. Yeah, it'd be awesome. Well, it fan- was great talking to you both. You were fantastic. Yeah, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, happy holidays, and I'll be in touch with you in about two weeks. Gracias. All right, thank you. Have a good night. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.